Hi there, I'm James Dapache and this is Coffee and a Case Note. Team, today we are going to take some time to talk about a partnership dispute. All right. This is a partnership that involves five partners. Four of the partners are siblings, and one of the partners is married to one of the siblings. And we'll call this sibling D1, or Defendant 1, uh, and we'll call uh, Defendant 1's spouse Defendant 2, and we'll call these other three siblings over here the plaintiffs. We'll get into it as we work through it. Now, what's this partnership all about? Um, the defendants who are all siblings are actually children of their parents, and their parents operated some businesses in some shops. And in essence, this partnership between the five of them, the four siblings and the sister-in-law, uh, begins as owning these shops, renting them out, collecting the rental income. Now, the ownership of these, of these shops is recorded uh, in the proportion of uh, this sibling who is a plaintiff as to one quarter, this sibling who is a plaintiff as to one quarter, this sibling who is a plaintiff as to one quarter, and the remaining quarter is jointly held uh, by the uh, spousal team over here, defendant one and defendant two. And the drawings of the partnership, which is to say uh, the profits of the partnership that get distributed out to the partners, are distributed in that proportion. Quarter, 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 and then you know, sharing a quarter. And we'll call that the four quarters basis. Uh, and you'll see why that's going to be relevant as we march on. Now, over time, uh, the partnership goes reasonably well, and some of the partnership funds derived from the renting out of these shops are applied to buy some units in some nearby suburbs. And what is interesting is that the ownership proportions of these units are recorded, speaking roughly, in what we might call a five-fifths basis, where each partner, including Defendant 1 and Defendant 2, our spousal partners, are recorded as having an equal share. And so we have our four quarters partnership in respect of the shops. And then we have this strange five fifths arrangement arising in relation to some units. Now, what's gonna be very relevant now, of course, is the partnership agreement. And there is no written partnership agreement. And indeed, um, there is no real firm and clear understanding between the partners as to the basis of the partnership. And obviously, this is going to become the heart of the dispute. Now, after a time, the units that have been bought with partnership money are sold. And the sale proceeds are distributed in the proportion, essentially, of one-fifth, 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 or something similar to that. Certainly not in the four quarters proportion, if we can put it that way. Now, um, the way this partnership operates over time is that defendant one, who uh, is the older sibling of the set of siblings, essentially takes a very firm hand in operating the affairs of the partnership. And that is, broadly speaking, with the approval of the three uh, junior siblings, if we can put it that way. And so it is defendant one who is dealing with the accountant, defendant one who is dealing with the lawyer, and defendant one who is you know, holding, the, holding the whip in relation to how the partnership's going to work. And defendant one, appropriately enough, you might agree, um, takes some management fees in respect of doing that management work. Now, um, over time, the uh, junior partners, if we put it that way, become less and less satisfied with uh, the way the partnership is running and the partnership is dissolved uh, in about 2019. And we then come to the knotty issue that is often at the heart of partnership disputes of what on earth are we going to do with all these assets? Now, in many cases, a receiver manager is appointed to uh, deal with the dissolution of a partnership. That's a third party who comes in, you know, gets all the partnership's assets and distributes them in accordance with the partnership proportions. That doesn't happen here. And the partners are attempting to, I'll use the term wind up loosely, when we speak about a partnership, to wind up the affairs of the partnership as effectively as they can without the help of an external administrator of that kind. Now, a few wrinkles and issues arise. One of them is that um, the sale of the shops owned by the partnership are valued uh, at about 12.8 million if they're sold uh, one by one by one by one, 
and at 12 million if they're sold in a line. And so there's an issue as to what we're going to do about it. There's an agreement in relation to a company that is essentially the predecessor of the partnership that sees options for those shareholders in that old company. Maybe you don't have shareholders in a partnership. This is a sort of a predecessor arrangement for these shops. The shareholders in that old company would have had the option to buy out a partner rather than having to have the properties go to public auction. And so there's this argument, are we going to go to public auction or not? I'll give away the ending of that now, which is the court finds that it is appropriate that the parties go ahead to public auction with each partner obviously able to bid at that public auction um, at an appropriate you know, commercial level. So the remaining issue, um, as you might remember, is this four quarters versus five fifths issue. Now, um, our defendant one and defendant two are pressing for an interpretation of the uh, oral partnership agreement that is, uh, doesn't have clear terms on the basis that it is five fifths and our plaintiffs are pressing on the basis that it is four quarters. Of course, just to refresh your memory, when I say four quarters, I'm speaking loosely. Three quarters and a couple of eighths, you might say, or three quarters and one joint quarter, if I can put it that way, between defendant one and defendant two being that final quarter. Now, the court has to balance up uh, the arguments in favour of each. Firstly, there are two different parts of the Partnership Act that are going to be relevant. This is the New South Wales Partnership Act, and there are some variations between jurisdictions. It's section 21 and section 24 we look at. So uh, in relation to the argument raised by the defendants, um, there's a part of the Partnership Act that says, uh, hey, uh, partnership property is owned equally by all the partners of the partnership. And so the defendants might say there are five partners of the partnership, and so slice everything into five. Now, another section of the Partnership Act says that property that is bought with partnership money becomes property of the partnership. And so, as you might remember, um, the partnership began in quarter, 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 quarter. And the money from that quarter, 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 quarter arrangement was applied to purchase those units. And so, arguably, based on that other section of the Partnership Act that I raise, um, the fact that partnership money was applied to buy those units, mean those units were partnership property and ought to be distributed in the partnership proportion that informed the original purchase of the shops. Complex stuff, as you might imagine. The defendants go on to say, um, particularly defendant one says, hey, um, five-fifths is appropriate because I uh, was bringing to the partnership profitable uh, properties and bringing value to the partnership. And so it's appropriate that my, or, or, or my family's, as it were, uh, my immediate family, as, as it were, um, um, entitlement be increased up to account for my additional work. What is also clear over the years is how informal all the arrangements are between the parties. And what happens is that um, there have been some financial reports and some tax returns prepared on a five-fifths basis and some distributions made on that basis. And um, so we have our defendant one who has signed some four quarters financial reports and some five fifths. And we have our plaintiffs who themselves have actually signed off on receiving some of the funds from the sale of some units in their five fifths proportion, notwithstanding the fact they're now arguing for four quarters. I hope that makes sense and it hasn't bent all of our brains around too much. And so what the defendants say is I was bringing these profitable opportunities to the partnership, uh, was saying that, uh, hey, there were some tax issues and some distribution of funds that were dealt with on the five-fifths basis. And so five-fifths is indeed the nature of the agreement. What the plaintiffs say is that there is no evidence the partnership agreement was changed, is that the four-quarters arrangement dealt with the initial position and generally um, that there was no basis for disturbing the four quarters, including based on the fact that the partnership funds, as you might remember, were used to purchase the units. So the court, in essence, comes down on the side of the plaintiffs and finds that for the reasons I've just mentioned and a couple of additional others, that it's appropriate that the partnership assets be divided on that four quarters basis and that five fifths falls away. I hope that chat assisted you and I look forward to speaking again soon over another coffee 
and um, in respect of another case note. Cheers.